All right. So I am going to go ahead. We'll get things kicked off. I'm sure we'll have uh, more folks joining us here as we jump in. But welcome to those of you who are joining us for our very first in um, a series of webinars that we're doing with Rick Vasquez, who you see here. And these are our compliance chats webinars. We're going to be doing about two of these every month on a variety of topics. Um, they're always open to all. You don't have to be a Bravo customer, but we're excited to kick off this series. And today, um, we are just going to be covering really um, a guide to bump stocks, pistols to rifle, conversion devices, and concealed firearms. And in uh, particular for the agenda today, what we'll cover is I want to intro you to um, Rick. I'm not sure if Kyle is going to be joining us, but Kyle is a team member of Rick's and he'll be leading some of the other webinars. So I want to familiarize you with him as well. And then um, Rick is really going to lead us through some of the common questions and misconceptions and, of course, providing some clarification uh, for, regu for regulations for the variety of topics you see listed there. And we'll also have time for open Q&A. My name is Kathleen Owen. I'm the head of marketing at Bravo. And uh, Bravo and Rick, Rick Vasquez Firearms, partnered up about a month ago now, Rick, um, because while Bravo provides a, a fully compliant, 100% ATF compliant point of sale solution for FFLs, we know that there's a whole number of things that uh, services that we don't offer, right, as a software provider. And so we know that um, Rick is this great addition to um, service offerings for our customers. Um, so real quick, before we jump into the meat of everything, um, I want you to meet Rick and Kyle. So Rick, why don't you take a minute? I've put a couple of highlights of your career, but it's very extensive. If you just want to share a little bit about yourself and your experience. I will. And I don't want to go too much into this because we want to get to the meat and potatoes. Yep. But I'm very happy to be joining Romro. It's kind of funny the way we, we met and joined up is on an email, them offered me services and I offered them services in response. And we talked right away and realized there was a great partnership there. I have uh, an extensive amount of experience in the firearms field. Uh, but I what I really want to center on is what we're going to be doing now. We're going to be doing a lot of compliance work to ensure that you never lose your license. That's what our goal is. Uh, we want to ensure that we properly give you the right regulations, the right statutes, and, and things of that nature. I can talk to you about what I did in the Marine Corps and was on embassy duty, diplomatic security, and Worked for ATF, was in charge of the firearms technology branch, firearms tra trafficking branch, and you know traveled the world. Had a phenomenal life so far. But the important part is what what we can do for you, especially as a team. Uh, everything's going electronic, without a doubt. And one of the things that you will realize is, regardless of how good it is, there's going to be things that you just don't know. And when you get an inspection you will lose your license on a regular basis now. The license revocations were 500% in 2023 over 2022. That, that is just, how do you even come up with that? How did, how did they even get to that point? So one of the things we're gonna do is start giving these webinars and then offering our services uh, to the clients of, of Bravo. And, and these are the different things we can do. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. We can come to your facility. We can look at some of your stuff online. And the biggest thing to remember is it costs money to ensure your compliance is right. Once your license goes into revocation, the money goes up exponentially. And the percentage of people losing, going into revocation and keeping their license is like one or 2%. So the likelihood of you keeping your license once ATF finds any type of uh, uh, um, violations is pretty slim, and you're going to spend a heck of a lot more money than you did if you just took care of it in the first place. So look at what we do. Um, email us on Bravo's uh, system. Uh, if you have any questions, we're going to set up a help desk type system. And we're going to take care of the clients as, as best we can. And we do, like I said, security, SOPs for your range, 
I am working on three criminal cases right now defending range policies. Because if something happens on your range and you do it 100% perfect, they're going to sue you. I mean, that's the bottom line because they hope your insurance company is going to go and do some type of settlement. So to no matter what, so the best protection is to have a good process in place and that way you can at least do your best to win against this lawsuit. So Wonderful. I think that's enough of an introduction there. Yeah, I think it is. And you can see, we put the services up near the end. We'll also have all of Rick's contact information, our contact information uh, for Bravo. If you're looking for you know different point of sale systems or things like Digital 4473, right? We're the software organization. So you can see the breadth of services offered by Rick and his team. But our webinars are going to focus a bit more on kind of this consulting aspect, right? And then if you are a Bravo customer and you reach out to Rick, there are some exclusive discounts on his services if you're um, a Bravo customer. But let's jump into it. Rick, thank you again for being here. Okay, so let's go right into the meat and potatoes. You want to start with conversion devices and obviously some other topics that are listed here at the top. Absolutely. And I'll let you know we're ready to go through slides and, and right. go to the next slide and we'll, we'll keep on. Can you see this side on here with the conversion devices and the machine guns, disguised firearms? Oh, it's beautiful. You guys okay. did a great job. Uh, did you want to talk through this? Some of the. Oh, well, that's a good point. I was, I'm used to just going jumping from one into the other. We're going to talk about conversion device, machine guns, and disguised firearms. And a conversion device pertains to something that can convert a semi automatic firearm into a machine gun. And I'm going to give you such a bizarre example, uh, you're not going to even believe it. And, and SKS, and most of you guys are familiar with firearms, it's, you know, the semi-automatic uh, predecessor to the AK. It is very simple to convert. I'm not going to tell you how. But what a gentleman did was he drilled a couple of holes in the bottom of his trigger guard, and he put a paper clip, a heavy paper clip, inside those two holes. And it allowed the uh, sear bar and the steer, sear to stay engaged. So as long as you pull the trigger, it would fire. So was that paperclip a conversion device? At the time it was used, yes. If I have paperclips in my drawer, they're not conversion devices. You know, so that's one of the things we want to make sure, because these things are being sold on the internet and people are getting prosecuted on a daily basis. And so we want to ensure that you know what they are and you're not purchasing them because they are considered just if you had a Thompson or M60 machine gun, that conversion device is the same definition and holds the same 10-year penalty plus a felony if convicted. And Disguise right, firearms? Go ahead. Do you find that are those um, generally uh, for people who are coming to you, are they... Are those some of the common questions is what is considered a conversion device and what isn't? What do I need to be wary of? Are there some kind of tips and tricks you can share with the listeners? We're, we're going to talk about it when we get uh, show the okay. pictures of conversion device, but that is a very good point because, and I'll hit on that right now. Now with the internet and sales from China and everywhere else, Russia, conversion devices for AR-15s and Glocks are prolific. I mean, you can get online right now and find one. And Customs and Border Protection and ATF are actively seeking those URLs and those websites, and they are prosecuting people for these solvent traps, which is a silencer, but those are the things that are being prosecuted right now. Solvent traps, conversion devices, they are actively prosecuting people. And everybody says, well, well I'm just a gun guy. Why are they coming after me? Low-hanging fruit. Did you order a conversion device from... What, what was that, Alibaba, whatever that Chinese mm -hmm. website is? Uh, well, it came to your house. It was charged to your credit card. You received it. You put it in your gun. How easy is that to prosecute? So they have you for mail fraud. That's automatic. Mail fraud, that's a felony. They have you for purchasing a conversion device and installing it in your firearm. When you go to a jury, it's cut and dry. And they're, generally, people are going to plead guilty to a felony. So they'll get uh, less than a year or time or no time. They get a felony, low-hanging fruit. 
So the federal agents are prosecuting those very heavy right now. And do you want me to roll ahead? It sounds like, it looks like yes. we have more specifics. Okay. And we're going to talk about bump stock because if, if you're a person who owns firearms, you know bump stock. Just go to YouTube and every talking head in the world is talking about bump stocks. And there's a lot of bad information out there. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of the history and then talk about the bump stock itself. The bump stock came in after what was called the Aikens Accelerator. And the Aikens Accelerator was classified as a machine gun because it operated with some springs and some hydraulics. So when you pulled the trigger, it became a, a, a simple machine, for lack of a better term. So it had actual parts and pieces that made it uh, operate. Well, you know, we live in the United States and, and people are so innovative, it's unbelievable. So a gentleman said, well, ATF just wrote this big fancy ruling that says a machine gun, when it pertains to this type of device, cannot, it has to have springs, hydraulics, electricity. He goes, what if I can just make it work off its own energy? So that's what he did. So the firearm sets in the bump stock, and when you pull the trigger, it, the, the recoil uh, is allowed to float back. And then because you're pulling forward, at the same time, when you pull it forward, it fires. It doesn't fit in the definition of single function of the trigger. So this classification that we made on this uh, uh, bump stock, that it was not a machine gun, went all the way to Congress. It went all the way to Senator Feinstein's office because ATF knew that this was going to be controversial. So we did it right. I mean, we checked every single dot. Everybody agreed with our opinion, but they wanted to make sure, the headquarters want to make sure that no one's going to get in trouble. Well, of course, Senator Feinstein re re uh, refused to talk to ATF about it. So we launched the approval and it was approved as a bump stock. So, so bump stocks became very popular. They were, they were selling, I mean, good Lord, they were selling like, you know, almost like Bud Light, you know, at the time. They were selling like crazy. And of course, uh, um, the mass shooting in Las Vegas, unfortunately, President Trump came out and said, I want these turned into machine guns no matter what. Now, this has been in litigation ever since then. And there's, it's at the point, there's a possibility that it's going to be heard by the Supreme Court. Because I believe it was the Fifth, Fifth Circuit overturned ATF's opinion that it was a machine gun, said it wasn't a machine gun, and now it's up to ATF now. So ATF has requested that the Supreme Court look at it. I think if the Supreme Court looks at it, it is not going to be a machine gun. So if you have one hidden and polyethylene pipe underground, don't pull it out yet. And don't cut it up. Just keep it hidden so that nobody knows you have it. So that's the way bump stocks operate, and that's what a bump stock is. As of right now, it is classified as a machine gun. Next slide. Pistol to rifle conversion. This is a kind of a complex issue that uh, I was a part of this ruling also. Because a question came out, I have a pistol, and everything that ATF does and I'll go through the ruling, but I want to give a little explanation first. Everything that ATF does is based on the Gun Control Act and the National Firearms Act definitions and their regulations. So Title 18, uh, Chapter 44 is a Gun Control Act. Uh, 27 CFR, Code of Federal Regulations, is the regulations that clarify 478 being for the Gun Control Act, 479 being for the NFA, which is Title 26, which is the tax code. So these definitions are under Title 26. And remember that the original NFA is under the tax code. It became part of the criminal code in 1968 when it became Title II of the Gun Control Act. So I just gave you some information a lot of people don't know. You always hear Title II firearms. That's where Title II comes from. The NFA is Title II of the Gun Control Act. So a firearm is defined by the National Firearms Act. Um, let me, how can I move these photos out? There, I did it. Uh, 26 USC 5845A3 is made when an undisciplined parts are placed in close proximity in a way 
has served no useful purpose other than to make a rifle having a barrel or barrels or less than 15 inches in length. So that's a short barrel rifle if it's less than 16 inches or convert a complete weapon to such an NFA firearm. A firearm as defined by 26 U.S.C. 5845A3 and A4 is not made when parts within a kit were originally designed to be configured as both a pistol and a rifle are assembled or reassembled in a configuration not regulated under the NFA, e.g. as a pistol or a rifle with a barrel of 16 inches or more in length. A firearm as defined by 26 U.S.C. 5845A3 and A4 is not made when a pistol is attached to a part or parts designed to convert the pistol into a rifle with a barrel or barrels of 16 inches or more in length, and the parts are later assembled in a configuration not regulated under the NFA as a pistol. A firearm is defined by 26 U.S.C. 5845A4 is made when a handgun or other weapon with an overall length of less than 26 inches or barrel or barrels of less than 16 inches length is assembled or produced from a weapon originally assembled or produced only as a rifle. As we know, attorneys write these regulations in its rulings. So let me tell you how this came about. If I have a rifle that has a 16 inch barrel and I cut that barrel down to 14 inches, it becomes a short barrel rifle. Now, if I take a pistol and turn it into a rifle, what happens if I take that long barrel of 16 inches and the stock off? There was people in ATF that said once they turned it into a rifle, you could never convert it back to a pistol, that it was still a short barrel rifle. So this was something I was personally involved with. So I said, well, show me in the definition a pistol made from a rifle. Show me under the Gun Control Act or the National Firearm. There's no such thing. So if you put a barrel and a stock on a pistol and you take that barrel and stock off, all you're doing is putting it back into a pistol configuration. So they were willing to prosecute people without looking at the definitions because a person had made a rifle and then converted it back to a pistol and they were saying no. It, it, it is now a short barrel rifle. So we won and we put this ruling together. So that way, if you have a Glock 19 and you put a rifle stock on it and you put an 18 inch conversion barrel on it and it's a rifle at that time and you take the stock off, it becomes a pistol. Now you take the barrel off, it's still a pistol. But if you take a rifle you cannot turn a rifle that started life as a rifle and turn it into a pistol for the simple reason that the definition says a rifle must have a barrel longer than 16 inches and an overall length that exceeds 26 inches. So you see the difference in a rifle uh, that is converted into a pistol and a pistol that's converted into a rifle and then remade back into a pistol. So I just now, want to stop there and, and see if anybody um, on the line has questions, you can drop them into the chat or the q and I'll monitor those. If there's any specific questions you have for Rick on this, um, and I guess I would just ask Rick for business owners, right, who are buying, selling, trading this, right, and trying to understand the complexity of what we're looking at, an entire page of legalese. What are some of the common um, I guess, issues that business owners run into that you're talking to that could be avoided by either understanding the law or are there common misconceptions where you'd say, hey, my advice is do X, Y, Z. You know, avoid issues you, you must be a psychic because that is exactly the point that needs to be made. Everybody sells AR-15 receivers. What do you log them out as? You log them out as a firearm or receiver, you do not log it out as a pistol or a rifle. And here's the reason why. I buy an AR-15 receiver from Kathleen and you log it out as a rifle because I tell you that I'm gonna build it into a rifle. Well, I decide once I get home that I'm gonna build it into an AR-15 pistol. 
So the year goes by and I sell it to Joe. And Joe gets picked up for whatever reason it may be. And they do a trace of his firearm. And he's got a, he's in possession of an AR-15 pistol. And the trace goes back to the person who sold it. And the A&D book in the 4473 shows it was sold as a rifle. What do you think he's getting ready to be charged with? Possession of a short barrel rifle. So when you sell receivers, regardless of what your customer says, do not log it out as a pistol or rifle. Log it out as a receiver or a firearm. All right. Any questions on that? Looks like we don't have any in the chat now, but I'll keep monitoring that. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, here we go. This is a very, very important part. Possession of device or parts that will convert a semi-automatic firearm into a machine gun is possession of a machine gun. Now the machine gun has about five components. The term machine gun means any weapon which shoots is designed to shoot. So a machine gun like an AK-47, we all know what that is. It is designed to shoot and does shoot automatically unless it's broken. And the, the design feature and characteristic of an AK is has a hole through the receiver and a proper location to accept an automatic sear. So that design alone, whether it's an, a, uh, an AK receiver alone, if it has that design feature, it is a machine gun period, or can be readily restored to shoot. And a good example of that is, let's say, and this occurs a lot, and they just prosecuted a young man in Virginia Beach uh, about six months ago for this. People bring back machine guns illegally, unfortunately, coming back in the military, and then they sell these. And others will import parts kits from foreign countries and have the receiver cut in half with a, with a clean cut so they can weld it back together in the United States. Well, unfortunately, uh, there's just a common person who buys these. And restored to shoot means at one time, this was a machine gun. So if I had the same AK, bandsaw cut right through the center, so I had two per perfect halves, I could very readily weld that back together and restore it into automatic configuration. So the mere possession of those two halves that were bandsaw cut in the middle is possession of machine guns. So we go into automatically more than one shot without manual reloading by a single function of the trigger. I've got a gun and it breaks and it starts shooting automatically. And I think it's so cool. And I'm showing all my buddies, I'm at the range. Hey, look at my AR. I don't know what happened to it, but it's shooting automatically. Somebody hears it. They call the police. Police show up. It shoots automatically. And instead of taking the gun away from you, they call ATF. You're in possession of machine gun. So simple things like that could get you in trouble. Now, does when I say ATF would prosecute you, I would say 99% of the time, no, but I wouldn't trust some of these overzealous agents. The term shelling also include the frame or receiver of any such weapon. Any weapon that is designed as a machine gun is a machine gun receiver all by itself. Strip the parts, throw them away, it's still a machine gun. Any part designed and intended solely and exclusively or combination of parts designed and intended for use in converting a weapon into a machine gun. If you've been following anything on YouTube or GOA or any of these uh, uh, legal groups online, we all know that these two young men just got prosecuted for the auto key card because they drew out the lightning link and had a laser engraving of it on a piece of metal and ATF went after them and called that a machine gun. Um, I was not uh, asked to opine on that case by their attorneys. I don't know the whole story, but that tells you what I said earlier, prosecuting the low hanging fruit. Is a lightning link a machine gun? Yes, it is. Is an etching of a lightning link of a machine gun? I don't think so. But the jury believed that it was. And these two young men are now convicted felons and now going to jail for a long time. 
And then we get into any combination of parts designed and intended for use in converting a weapon into a machine gun. An AR-15 has AR-15 components from the factory. An M-16 has M-16 components from the factory. Those M-16 components are parts for a machine gun. They're not a conversion device. But if I put an M-16 hammer, trigger, disconnector, selector, and bolt into an AR-15, I don't need the automatic sear, it will, and I put it in the automatic position, that gun will fire on hammer follow through. And if you're not familiar what hammer follow through is, if you ever look at a cartridge that's been loaded into an AR-15, the firing pin always dimples the primer because the primer, uh, the firing pin is free floating. So if you put it in the automatic position, the disconnector takes the, uh, excuse me, the disconnector is pushed down and taken out of play. So the hammer just rides back and forth on the bolt. So now you have a firing pin that's already touching the primer and you have the additional weight and inertia of that hammer, it will cause it to fire. I have never seen one not fire that had these components installed in it. So can you install M16 components into an AR-15? Yes, you can. But if it shoots automatically, you're going to have a machine gun. I highly recommend never using the disconnector and never using the selector. Because if you're familiar with the way an AR-15 disconnector and selector work, the selector has a cam in the middle that pushes the longer M16 disconnector down and takes it out of play and allows the hammer to go back and forth. So these are all the different ways that you can be in possession of a machine gun. And we had talked early on about these conversion devices that be sold online. I just reviewed uh, for the defense, a young man in North Carolina was charged with possession of machine guns and he had bought everything online. He had bought drop-in auto sears, which is to convert an AR-15 into an M16. He had bought Glock auto sears, which of course is convert a Glock. And he had bought lightning links. They had him so good that the first offer they made him to plead guilty was 30 years. So that's how many charges he had against him. Don't think it's innocent if I buy one of these things off the internet because it means your freedom and your livelihood. Any questions on this? Not on this one, but we do have a question from um, Philip, who is a customer of Bravo, so a uh, business owner with an FFL. And he's asking if we can kind of take a step back. He says, so where are we now? Can we convert a rifle back into a pistol if it was originally a pistol? If it was originally a pistol and you remove the stock and barrel, well, actually, you've only you remove the stock because a pistol is not designed to be fired from the shoulder. But if you leave the stock on it, and if it was converted into a rifle, it has to have at least a 16-inch barrel. Otherwise, it would have been a short barrel rifle. So if you remove the stock, then it's back into its pistol configuration. And if you remove the barrel and put the original short barrel on it, then you're right back to the, to the original configuration of a pistol. All right, so Philip, if you want in the chat or you can go ahead and put it back in the Q&A if you feel like that answered your question or if you have some follow-up questions, let me know. All right, next slide, please. And I, and I put up some uh, photographs and Kathleen did a phenomenal job or somebody did putting all these together for me. Uh, and it shows the difference in the M16 hammer uh, disconnector. Uh, they're all set up to work within each other. So if you put in, and you can see the M16 disconnector, how long the rear is, and you put in the M16 selector, you can see the different cuttings in it. Uh, I can almost bet you a six pack of Coca-Cola that your gun will shoot automatically through hammer follow through. Next slide. And of course, if you've never seen a drop in auto sear, this is what it does. The long tail sticking up at the end replicates the function of the automatic sear 
that an M16 has. So you need all of the M16 components for this to work. But since it's designed and intended solely and exclusively for converting a semi-automatic weapon into a machine gun, it is defined as a machine gun all by itself. If somebody comes in and pawns you a gun, and later on you find out this is in there, uh, just, just turn it into local law enforcement. Call local law enforcement. Or I, I hate to say this, you know, destroy it so nobody sees because you never know when it's an entrapment issue. So I would definitely get a hold of local law enforcement um, and let them contact ATF on your behalf. Next and Rick, are these, the, are these the kind of things that, right, someone comes across one of these issues you're bringing up that they can pick up the phone, call you and work with you on how to handle these very kind of unique cases? You know, Kathleen, I don't know where you're coming from, but you are so bright. They can. And and we have a series of attorneys that we work with. And there's a lot of attorneys out there that that pick up a, a book today and they, and they see a gun and all of a sudden they're gun attorneys. And, but there's very few real gun attorneys in the United States. And if you want to uh, notify the authorities with an attorney, we can recommend a good attorney for you uh, because people get terrified that they're go automatically going to be arrested for possession of machine gun. And are you in possession of machine gun? That's the bad thing about it. You are in possession of machine gun. And this is one of those things where you may have to prove yourself innocent, not prove that you weren't guilty. You have to prove that you were innocent. If they came in and did an inventory and found this in your toolbox where you had indiscriminately taken out of a firearm you took in, they're going to say that you had that drop in auto sear in your toolbox for some reason. So you can take these slides, I'm sure they can print them off or look at them, uh, remember what these things look like because they are, I hate to say it, they're almost as common as pennies. There's so many of these being imported into the United States that it is unbelievable. Yeah, and you know, we are recording this. So everybody who's on here today, you'll get the recording. So all of these, the slides, and of course the commentary um, and instruction from Rick is gonna be on here. So you'll have all of this. And, and just for your information, we made this short to fit in a certain amount of time. The actual different, my machine gun identification course has about 60 slides of just photographs of different conversion devices. And, this is the auto connector of the lightning link, and this is the one that these two gentlemen were just convicted about two weeks ago. It is designed to convert a semi-automatic AR-15 into a machine gun. They don't work very well, but the problem with, and this is what the jury believed from the judge's instruction, what is a lightning link for? It's not a fan belt. It's not a tire. It's not a book. A lightning link is designed and intended to convert a semi-automatic firearm into a machine gun. So that's the instructions that the jury heard. So they have no other choice but to convict these two young men because they were in possession of lightning links. And these sources, these are generally coming from the European theater. And, and uh, what we're seeing now on the lightning link is they're being 3D printed. Uh, the 3D printed ones obviously don't last as long because they're plastic, but those are hitting the market uh, from China. These lightning links are coming from the European theater and they're being shipped by US mail. They put in their camera components. You x-ray this, who knows what this is? Uh, the postal inspectors generally don't know what these are. So they make it through the mail on a regular basis. And, if they walked up to my door and said, hey, you just received something from so-and-so. If you say, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but they already pulled up your credit card where you paid somebody or your PayPal where you paid somebody, they're gonna get you in possession of a machine gun. So I, I don't try to be scary. We just want you guys to be careful and stay in business till you're about 120 years old. Any other questions on these? Not on these ones, not right now. Okay, next slide, please. And this this one, 
has become so common. This makes the news every day. These are coming out of China. The one that's in the photo on the right hand side, made in Austria, these were being made in Israel. Uh, they're being made in Brazil also, but they prosecuted a gentleman in Brazil. And but the ones out of Israel, they've tried to uh, run that gentleman down and they haven't been, a, been able to, but they're coming out of China on it like a regular basis. Uh, it's just like, you know, buying tires from China. These Glock auto sears are coming out and it will take a person who knows a Glock. It'll take less than 30 seconds to install this in a Glock and they're they're made with precision and you immediately have a machine gun. Of course, if you've ever shot one of these with the auto sear in it, I mean, they shoot around 1,300, 1,800 rounds per, per minute, and they're very hard to control. This is going back to the days uh, when they used to term the, the Max, the drive-by Max, the Mac 10s and Mac 11s, where these gang baners would weld a firing pin into four position and put a 30 round magazine and uh, drive-by and they would just pull the bolt to the rear and it would empty a 30 round magazine, it had no control. These, you can pull the trigger and control, but they're still rapid fire. And they got the term of the, uh, the drive-by Mac in, in Los Angeles, because they didn't care where the 30 round magazine went. And this is what's happening in with these Glocks. And they're very, very prolific down in the Texas, Houston area, of course, LA and, and all through uh, Arizona. Um, I haven't heard much of them in, in up in the northeastern states, so they seem to be in areas where there's a lot of drug trafficking. Hmm. Next slide, please. Disguise firearms. I, I put something up that would catch somebody's attention. This isn't a very common one. We actually viewed uh, uh, one similar to this when, when I was with ATF. It was, it was brought over to us to one of the... Uh, clandestine agencies and allowed us to look at it. And we actually fired it. Uh, but firearms uh, are hidden in a variety of ways. And generally, um, it's not your normal criminal on the street, the guy who's robbing old ladies. It's uh, uh, We see it with, they were very common with um, motorcycle gangs of all things. Mm -hmm. if, you're, if you live on the coast, especially around Florida, they used to sell what was called a bang stick. And it had a head on it that could take a shotgun shell or a, a pistol shell. They're in a variety of calibers. Well, it wasn't classified as a firearm. It was classified as a tool because it had a 48-inch rod welded to it. Well, you know, if you're a criminal and you want to make a firearm, all you do is cut off the rod. Now, they were making an NFA firearm, but that doesn't mean too much to people who are looking for something to kill somebody. And so those were very common in Florida for a while, but I think with the advent of not killing sharks and, and big fish underwater, you don't see those much anymore because they have no cells uh, around them. Next slide. And this is a keychain gun. Uh, I don't wanna say it's common, uh, but, it, but it is not rare. And like I said, the disguised firearm, there's over a hundred different slides of different types of disguised firearms. One thing you need to remember, these are not regulated only by the Gun Control Act. This is the important part. Somebody comes up to you and thinks you got a rare, unique uh, uh, item and you say, man, I'm going to make some money off this. This is regulated under the NFA. And if it's not registered, it's contraband. So turn them away. Uh, just in case it's a setup, say, get out of my store. Now, if somebody walks into you with what's called a Nazi belt buckle gun, and you think it is rare, rare and, and original, because there's a lot of counterfeits, that has been removed from the NFA uh, because of collector's item. But I don't think you would know the difference between a real one and a homemade one. So regardless of what comes in, if it's a pistol, and it doesn't have a pistol grip, like it's designed to be fired from the hand. And if it's not a rifle, designed to be fired from the shoulder, a shotgun, a common firearm, you can always reach out to me uh, with photographs. I can uh, tell you what it is. And if necessary, and you want to abandon it, we can help you through that also. Next slide. 
Uh, we covered that presentation uh, fairly easily. Uh, we have time, I believe, for, for some more questions. Yeah, we do. So if anybody has any questions, we can go back, we can revisit uh, anything Rick's covered, or if there's just other questions um, that perhaps we didn't cover, because this was a, a brief presentation, go ahead, drop those in the chat or Q&A. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I obviously put Rick's contact information up there so you can check out the website. I know in the beginning of the presentation, we laid out the breadth of services that he and his team offer. You can get a lot more information on that. Also, Rick's entire kind of um, or much more extensive uh, listing of his experience and work uh, in the firearms industry, a phone and email there. If you're a Bravo customer, um, there are discounts on Rick's services. Even if you're not a Bravo customer, we're very happy that you're on today. Certainly contact uh, Rick for that as well. And if you're interested in learning more about Bravo, our point of sale systems and the solutions that we have um, for FFLs, you can email, call us. Um, also, of course, visit our website. So I don't see any questions that are in the chat and Q&A. I do just want to remind everyone that this is the first of many webinars in our compliance chat series that we'll have with Rick and from time to time other team members. Um, so if you go to Bravo's website and you look under our resources, you'll see upcoming webinars. We already have another one scheduled um, for early June. Kyle, who is one of uh, Rick's colleagues, will be on there, and we're going to be focusing on you know, what to do in the case of a medical emergency at a range or even at your store. Um, so again, some common things uh, that they deal with. Rick, thank you so much for joining mm -hmm. us today. So much information here um, and really good information, but we're just so happy to be partnered with, with you and with your team. I uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I look forward to developing uh, uh, more clientele. And right now, just to let you know, one of the things that Kyle and I are working on, uh, we are both have probably, I would say together, eight cases that we're working on defending people in the firearms industry against frivolous lawsuits and frivolous criminal charges. So we are here for you. Uh, Keep us in mind, look us up, and give us a call. Wonderful. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us. We'll get this recording out uh, later this week for all of you. It'll also be posted on our website. And Rick, thanks again. We'll talk soon. All right. Have a great day, guys. All right. Bye-bye.